So I hope we are ready to begin. Um, my name is Martin Wolf, and I have the great honor and pleasure of moderating this really important panel with very distinguished participants. And our subject is very timely and globally important, which is the North-South Schism. And uh, before I introduce the discussion, I just very briefly wish to introduce the panelists, though I think they are sufficiently famous uh, that you will know who they all are. Immediately to my left is Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, who's Director General of the World Trade Organization uh, and a member of the Board of Trustees of this distinguished institution. To her left is Gustavo Petro, who's President of Colombia. To his left is Paul Kagami, who's President of Rwanda. To his left is William H. Gates, or Bill Gates, as most of us know him, um, who is, among many other things, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And finally, to his left is Mark Rutte, Prime Minister of the Netherlands. And we're going to proceed. There's, we won't be doing Q&A. We won't have time. We're going to discuss first the overarching problem of governance. Each of them will make a short contribution to that. Um, and then we're going to have specific interventions on four big themes, trade, finance, health, and climate. And after that, if everybody's been very good at time, we will have the opportunity to have an interchange amongst us. I just thought I'd make a minute's worth of introduction um, because for me, this is a very, very interesting topic. Um, there are many disadvantages of becoming older, but one of them is that you remember things that are relevant. When I started uh, working at the World Bank in 1971, this was right at the beginning of the 70s. And this seems to me a period which has some similarities. Not only were there the oil shocks, the war in the Middle East, uh, inflation, uh, and all the instability associated with that, these things, we also had an institution or grouping called the Group of 70, and they were arguing very, very powerfully for a new international economic order. This was a north-south schism. And one, I won't go further, but one very interesting book at that time, uh, which was published in the middle of the 70s, was called the United States in opposition. Of course, you know that what subsequently happened in the 80s and 90s was not a new international economic order, but the, the era of globalization. Um, and we now feel at the end of that. But I think it is important to remember that we have been seen problems like this before, and we have managed them really successfully. And it is immensely important that we do Though, of course, our challenges today include things like climate and health, um, which were less obvious then. And we also have to say that over the last 50 years, there has been staggering progress in development, which, of course, is now significantly troubled. So with that introduction, let me ask the panelists in order to make their brief comments on what is, from their perspective, the governance problem today in this context of North-South relations. And may I start with you, uh, President Kagami. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me address this by uh, starting with the two crises that uh, yeah, define uh, the pessimism in the South uh, about this international cooperation. One is when we saw when COVID happened. Uh, one is COVID, another is uh, what happened with inflation and interest rates, the interest rate crisis that uh, followed. With the COVID, 
it was clear that access to vaccines and uh, therapeutics had a problem. And it was mainly concentrated in the north. The south was to be considered much later, uh, even then very slowly, nearly too late, because the South did not have this capacity to produce their own vaccines or therapeutics. And then, coupled with many years of fiscal stimulus by the West, we saw that they developed an inflation crisis. And the response to that was to raise interest rates, which very many in the South are still paying a very high price for. Now, we cannot address this inequality by just uh, mitigating the crisis, but rather we need to integrate, to bring in, to involve developing countries like Africa and other developing countries from the beginning to have the conversations around how these inequalities should not be developing and later on affecting the particular parts of the world. So it has to be from the beginning. It's not just at the time when crises have happened that then you start making consideration of what to do for the South, but rather they should be involved. And uh, Africa should be given and should be tools that are there, that are available, to actually work on some of these uh, things that uh, are needed to, to be addressed. Uh, and Africa will therefore uh, stand <coughs> to gain uh, and have access to most of these things required. Thank you very much. That's very clear and very helpful in this discussion. May I turn to you, Prime Minister Ruta, for your perspective um, perhaps in, partly in response, but what do you think are the really big issues in this context that we now face? But, but let me be slightly uh, provocative. I think for, for all of us, uh, being the president of Rwanda or uh, Colombia, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, uh, we have basically two tasks. One is to make sure that our countries are safe, and secondly, make sure that the economy is doing well and that people have a job. Uh, and can, can take care of their own lives. Um, in that sense, um, I have a bit of an issue with constantly talking about the schism, the divide between the North and the South. I hope we are moving beyond that now, because we need each other. And we have seen so in Dubai at uh, the COP28 that you can do that even successfully. Um, and that would be my second comment. There is constantly this debate, also in my country, between not a nationalism. Should we stay a member of the EU and the role of WTO and the UN, etc., as if that is something you can oppose to being uh, interested in a national level? You cannot be a politician uh, working at a national level, taking care of the national interest, if you are not part of a strong multilateral system. And that means that that strong multilateral system, we have to invest in it. It has to be rules-based. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we have enough discussions and talks on how to progress it, like the WTO, which has had some difficulty, but under the current leadership, I'm happy to say we see progress in a number of important fields. So there is not a schism between North and South, I would argue, for this debate. There is not a schism between the national level and multilateralism. If we want to be strong politicians, and providing the jobs, providing the collective safety and security at the national level, we need both strong countries and strong multilateral uh, organizations. And uh, I think in, the, uh, in, in following on on this first round, uh, Martin, I think we have many subjects and examples 
of where we are successfully doing that, be it fisheries in the WTO, to even getting an agreement on loss and damage at COP28 in Dubai. We have done that. Thank you very much for that. Now it is your turn, Director General. Well, thank, thank you, Martin, and it's very nice to I say thank you for the kind comments of Prime Minister Rote and the progress at the WTO. Um, I, but I just want to build on what President Kagame and Prime Minister Rote said, to say that if we look at some numbers of what is happening in terms of shares of global output in the world, we see that let's, in 1995, emerging markets and developing economies accounted for about 42% of global output, of global GDP, and developed countries for about 58%. And now, in 2022, we see a situation where this is inverted. And so these changing shares of world output, and we see it mirrored also in some of the shares of trade, which I'll come back to later, speak to the multipolarity of the world, that we are now in a multipolar world. Uh, there's no one power center. Um, and what worries me in global governance is how we manage this multipolarity. Uh, there is no one center that can solve all the problems of the world. We are interdependent and we need to work together and that speaks to the issue of how do we do it and this is where multilateral organizations need to be strengthened, of course need to be reformed to move with the times they are in, uh, but we absolutely need them because we have to solve some problems of the global commons, like climate change, you alluded to it, the pandemic that President Kagame uh, talked about. And that, how do we manage this to solve global problems, this multipolarity? That's my issue. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I think we're getting to a certain, so far, a certain degree of agreement, um, which um, may I now ask President um, Gustavo Petro to make his contribution. He will be talking in Spanish. Um, and for those who don't understand it, unfortunately, I'm one of them. Um, you might use, use the headphones. Bien, gracias. El... Hace un año, y creo que en esto me separo un poco de Mark, en que no existe un camino, están los dos caminos abiertos. De hecho, estamos andando el camino del cisma entre el norte y el sur. Existe el otro camino, que es el del pacto, pacto entre iguales. Hace un año, precisamente, este foro acuñó una palabra que se llamó policrisis. Uh, sorry, I'm afraid I'm not getting sound. Are you all getting sound? Yeah. Oh, dear. Yes, um, we, we are. This uh, is... Number one, uh, Martin. It's number one, yes? yes? Yeah. I'm hearing nothing. I apologize. Hold on um, a second. Probably nothing I can do about it. Okay, go ahead and I will do my best. Bueno, re I apologize. I don't know what I can do about it. <laughs> Gracias. El, el tema es eh, que hace un año el foro acuñó la palabra policrisis. Habló de la guerra, habló del hambre, que en ese momento, un día en el mundo, producto de la pandemia, la enfermedad, la pobreza y el estancamiento económico. Hoy yo pienso que eso, después de un año, se ha agravado. Se ha agravado en términos de que de la guerra pasamos al genocidio, a bombardear niños y niñas. Uh -huh. Las votaciones en Naciones Unidas políticamente alrededor de este problema han separado físicamente, políticamente, el norte y el sur. Europa y Estados Unidos han votado a favor o en contra, depende de cómo se mire, de eh, una política para solucionar el problema de Palestina. Hay una separación política real. El tema de las vacunas separó desde el punto de vista del cuidado de la vida el norte y el sur. Se nos impuso una relación comercial para salvar la vida de los enfermos de COVID. 
Y entonces lo que hoy tenemos, variaría la palabra policrisis, es una crisis civilizatoria. Una crisis civilizatoria que tiene una raíz, un almendrón, es la crisis climática. La crisis climática, dependiendo cómo la abordemos o no la abordemos, nos puede llevar o a un pacto democrático de la humanidad o a la barbarie. Yo le llamo 1933 global. 1933 fue el día que subió Hitler al poder. Fue la, el año de Hitler en el poder. Puede ser uno de los dos caminos. Está cambiando completamente el paradigma mundial, político y económico, y por tanto social. La existencia humana está en cuestión. Y al cuestionarse la existencia se cuestiona todo lo que se había edificado en los últimos 50 años para bien y para mal. Por ejemplo, el concepto de cooperación, que es uno de los temas de este panel. Cooperación se construyó con la idea de un rico muy rico, un norte muy rico, un sur pobre, muy pobre, una idea de llevar dineros del norte al sur, yo le llamo limosna, en el sentido cristiano, y creer construir una buena conciencia mundial a partir de que el norte estaba ayudando al sur. Esa misma idea se está colocando en el centro de la solución a la crisis climática. Se piensa que la crisis climática se supera si hay una limosna del norte hacia el sur y las grandes discusiones de la COP han girado alrededor de ese tema. Los famosos 100 mil millones de dólares que se prometieron en el 2015 en París y resulta que ese concepto, ese paradigma de la cooperación hoy no es, hoy se estrella contra la realidad de la crisis civilizatoria mundial. Y no solo porque las cifras son enormemente superiores a 100 mil millones de dólares al año para solucionar un problema de toda la humanidad, sino porque la realidad para superar la crisis climática, que es el almendrón de la crisis civilizatoria de hoy, es diferente y no pasa por la cooperación. Y me explico, y trato de ser breve. Las chimeneas están en el norte. Las chimeneas de CO2 están en el norte. Luego toca es apagar las chimeneas en el norte. En primerísimo lugar, si no se apagan las chimeneas en el norte, las selvas del sur que sirven de esponjas se queman y entremos a un punto de no retorno, es decir, de definitiva extinción de la vida en el planeta. Es un problema crucial. El norte tiene que transformarse radicalmente desde el punto de vista económico y tecnológico para poder sostener la vida en el planeta en su conjunto. El sur es el que tiene que ayudar al norte en ese propósito, es al revés. ¿Por qué? Porque África y América del Sur son las regiones con mayor potencial planetario en generación de energía limpia. Y esto cambia completamente el, el, la geopolítica mundial. Nosotros somos los que podemos generar la energía limpia con la cual las chimeneas del norte se puedan apagar. Nos toca cooperar es con el norte. Y esto, digamos, ya más adelante entonces podremos hablar un poquito de qué significa el cambio entonces de las relaciones de poder en el mundo. Thank you very much. That's a really valuable contribution. I hope somebody would talk in that way. Um, finally, Bill Gates, your response or points. Well, there's no doubt uh, we find ourselves at a juncture where the demand for resources exceeds the resources available. And, you know, the needs coming out of Ukraine, the Middle East, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, you know, so many things, including basic development, uh, healthcare systems, education systems, all of these, the needs are, are pretty incredible. And I'd say there's three things we can do uh, to improve that situation that we have a shortage. Uh, the first is uh, we should try and be more generous. Those who have the most, whether it's countries, companies, or individuals, 
should be pushed uh, to be more generous. You know, for example, in the aid category, uh, getting up to 0.7%, or like Sweden and Norway, getting even beyond, uh, you know, that's imperative. The second thing is to focus in on the highest impact uh, areas, where a dollar of resources uh, is effective. I would say that there's almost a factor of 100 difference between some initiatives versus others, uh, and we really need to, to study that and do well. And foremost in that is going to the countries, uh, including in Africa, and saying, what are your priorities? You know, health, nutrition, education, uh, where would you like uh, to have these partnerships focus? Uh, the final area is innovation. Um, there's been far too little innovation on the needs of the global south, whether it's malaria, whether it's their crops that go way beyond the big three, rice, wheat, and maize. Uh, they have unique ecosystems, and the amount we put into improving that agricultural productivity is dramatically less than it should be. Uh, I'll just finish with one example that should remind us uh, that uh, the system of cooperation sometimes achieves miracles. Uh, Gavi was announced here at Davos in 2001. It raised money to buy vaccines. Of course, Ngozi was a, a great chairman for that, and everyone here has had some uh, engagement uh, with Gavi, I think, that we're all proud of. Uh, and at that time, over 10 million children died every year, and largely because of getting these vaccines, which were only available in the rich country, getting them out to all the children, and Rwanda is an exemplar with a 97% coverage rate, uh, those deaths have been reduced to 5 million a year. The Sustainable Development Goals, have, uh, which are uh, time for 2030, have a goal of getting that to 2.5 million. Because of the pandemic and many other things, we won't achieve that. But the question is, do we keep going down? Uh, do we get there during the 2030s or not? Um, with uh, the right prioritization, with taking innovation, including the latest AI innovation, uh, I think despite all these challenges, we can still do that. OK. Um, we slightly overrun, but we'll do our best. Um, could we turn very, very quickly, and I think please keep these remarks to a minute each, just m very pointed. What, on the basis of what you've heard, does this mean for the future of trade? Wow. Well, will you, I, I just need, again, uh, just a minute to illustrate what I want to talk about with some numbers. Okay. I come back uh, to the issue. In 1995, north-north trade between the developed economies accounted for about 54% of global trade. In 2022, this has come down to 39%. During the same period, that's in 1995, south-south trade was less than 10%. In 2022, it's now almost 25%. In the same period, North-South trade has been stable at about 35% or more, or so, 39% actually. So if you look at these numbers, you will see again some of the inversion that I was talking about, that the shares, South-South trade, the South is now turning trading much more with itself, becoming a power block. The North's share is diminishing. And it comes back to the issue I spoke about, about different centers of power, that there's no one center of power, and that we need to cooperate. But that being said, we find that at an organization at, like the WTO, uh, where the global trading system comes together, the multilateral trading system. We've managed to cooperate. 75% of world trade today is done on WTO terms. Just think about that. The bulk of world trade is still done on multilateral terms. So even though we have this multipolar world and these power blocks, 
We've managed to find a place where we can collaborate, cooperate, and deliver, just like Bill had said about there are places where we've been able to demonstrate that we can work together. Um, so on the trade front, we are doing that. That does not mean that we don't have issues, that we don't have emerging fragmentation, that we don't have um, you know, vulnerability of supply chains and need to build resilience. But we often forget the good parts of what's happening in trade and that cooperation in favor of the worries about protectionism and about uh, unilateral actions. So I wanted to put a marker uh, uh, on that. Thank you very much. I may turn to you, President Petro. I'd like you, if you could, to just very briefly indicate, based on your radical and critical view of what's going on, how, and I, I know you'd much rather have half an hour, but unfortunately they don't give us that, um, <laughs> to how do you change the global financial arrangements? Um, um, President Kagame has already referred to the interest rate shock and the impact that has had on developing countries. Um, there are many issues here, debt, um, how the IMF works, um, the um, monetary dominance of the developed countries. Just focus on what seems to you to be really important. Bien, si continúe un poco con como traía mi, mi exposición. Si vemos gráficamente las chimeneas del, que producen la crisis climática en el norte y la potencialidad de energías limpias en el sur, entonces el esquema cooperación, donaciones, limosnas del norte al sur no sirve para solucionar el problema de crisis, sino es la liberación de esa potencia del sur que puede ser deslocalización de producción del norte al sur o algo más importante. La liberación de la potencia del sur en generación de energías limpias que apagaría las chimeneas del norte tiene que ver con un cambio del sistema financiero mundial. Por ejemplo, la OMC, la Organización Mundial del Comercio, debe supeditar su normatividad a los acuerdos de París que deben ser vinculantes, no simplemente expresiones de buena voluntad. Si no, no cambiamos la correlación de fuerza que implica solucionar la crisis climática. O, por ejemplo, en el tema del sistema financiero mundial, la liberación de la potencia del sur para generar energías limpias y economía descarbonizada tiene que ver con liberar sus propios recursos, no necesitamos limonas. Nuestros propios recursos están supeditados, están absorbidos a través del endeudamiento de la tasa de interés y el servicio de la deuda que pagamos. Por ejemplo, Colombia paga una prima porque se le considera riesgoso, como Brasil, como Venezuela, como Ecuador, como todos los países de la selva amazónica. Lo riesgoso hoy no somos los países que tenemos la selva amazónica, son los países del norte, por varias razones. Ustedes representan más riesgos para la vida humana que nosotros. Nosotros tenemos la esponja. Por tanto, económicamente, esa prima debería volverse cero. Si la prima de riesgo se vuelve cero, nuestro endeudamiento y nuestro servicio de la deuda baja. Y los recursos nuestros que liberamos, en vez de pagar la deuda, irían a la acción climática. Si, se, si esto se hace en todo el planeta, que es una reforma del sistema financiero mundial, simplemente se libera la potencialidad del sur para generar las energías limpias y apagar las chimeneas del norte. Es el camino del pacto, no el camino del cisma. El otro es el que se está practicando hoy, que es el capitalismo de fortaleza que levanta muros y arroja bombas. Por ahí hay un cisma político en la humanidad. Por el otro lado, hay un pacto democrático de la humanidad. You are the next speaker, Prime Minister Rutte, and I think uh, as you and your chimneys are the source of the risk in the world, um, <laughs> though I think the Netherlands has fairly few chimneys now, but I might be wrong on that. Um, uh, so how do you respond on climate, and specifically on which yeah. the president has been 
um, very challenging, and he's absolutely right. There's no doubt the Amazon mega region yeah. is immensely important. Now, it's always good to have the uh, Colombian president on the panel, uh, and I'm always willing to oppose his views if necessary, but I do not disagree completely, because I agree with him on the necessity to reform the multilateral banking system. He's absolutely right on that in that sense. But I fundamentally disagree on his chimney point and the handouts. And why is that? Because if we, for example, the Netherlands would close down our steel mill in Aymuide, which employs 10,000 people directly and 40,000 people indirectly, there is this risk of a huge carbon leakage to other parts of the world. Because that steel is still necessary. And Tata will then produce that somewhere else. Uh, so what we need here is innovation. Um, to make ourselves uh, less dependent on particular types of products, for example, from the chemical industries. But innovation is the key here, not closing down the chimneys altogether. And the second thing where I disagree is on the handouts. It's not handouts. There is a phasing issue because the South is developing rapidly in Africa, in Latin America, everywhere. Um, but at this moment, there is still an issue to comply with the Paris Agreement to make sure that we can bridge the gap. And that is why the $100 billion pledge was created. That is why we had an agreement in Dubai on loss and damage. And I think that is very good. And it will help us to really uh, move forward. And, and, and I see him nodding yes, so uh, he is letting go of his previous position and agreeing with me. That's good. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. But now, to, to sum up, um, uh, I think when we talk about multilateralism, and the WTO is a case in point, because it is not easy at this moment. To, to deal with world trade. But for example, on fishery subsidies, we have been able to come to agreements. And there are other subjects, and there are still countries at, uh, joining uh, the WTO. But I think what you need here is rules, you need trust, and you need to discuss, to talk. So RTT, rules, talk, and trust. And for example, the WTO, but also the Paris Climate Agreement and the COP. The COPs coming from them, and the latest one in, UA, in the UAE, which, went, which was very successful as a case in point, that you can get there when you are willing to have a rules-based system, when you are willing uh, to discuss, sit together, like we are doing at this moment, and, and hammer out the issues, have our differences, and then come to an agreement. And that builds the trust. That's the only way to move forward. And that is why I say again, there is no schism between North and South. There is no schism between multilateralism. Uh, and the national interest and uh, parties like my, my own, the centrist parties, should be mo much more forcefully put forward that case in point. Because it is now the populist saying, oh, multilateralism is crazy, get rid of it, uh, it's, it's yesterday's story. No, you need both sides of the coin, multilateralism and strong nation states. Um, Bill Gates, finally on health and this round, um, I think President Kagame and President Petro both mentioned that um, during the COVID crisis, developing countries, many developing countries, probably most, um, felt they were treated as second class citizens of the world. The developed countries got all the vaccines first, they had the technology. Um, and uh, vaccine rates fell far, far behind in many important parts of the world, notably in Africa. Um, will we do better next time? Are we really set up and determined to treat a global health problem as a global problem? I wrote a lot about this at the time, and I wonder whether we really have learned the lessons. Well, in some respects, uh People don't want to talk about the pandemic at this point and how we uh, build the capacity to do um, trials where we practice, okay, are we ready? What would we need to do? And then we need to build better tools. Uh, for many of these problems where the total amount of money is going to be super limited and some elections would make the money even more limited than it is today, uh, we have to innovate. And a great example of that is now the uh, factories uh, that make mRNA vaccines, uh, a group in Belgium uh, funded uh, by the foundation can make those very inexpensively. And for me, the issue is not having vaccine factories in magic places. It's having enough capacity in the entire world 
uh, that we can get vaccines to everyone. Because uh, who, who you want to discriminate at, against, if the factories are cheap, you're, you're going to have that capacity. In fact, more vaccines were made in India. Uh, we funded Serum two months into the pandemic. They created a factory. Uh, we had a challenge that those vaccines, which were going to Africa for a period, became unavailable. But that was a South, South issue uh, that uh, uh, challenged that. We, we really need to up the dialogue of given limited resources. Where should the grant money go? I, you know, I would claim that nutrition and vaccines will always rise to the top of that list. And so as we see, is Gavi replenished later this year? It'll show, are we maintaining uh, uh, the very highest uh, impact investment that was ever made? And likewise on the innovation agenda, uh, President Kangami and I were talking about how Rwanda's moving forward on these digital initiatives and making uh, uh, multiple places in the South, including Rwanda, India, and many others, a laboratory where AI healthcare, AI education is done not five or 10 years after it's done in the North, but done at the same time. And in fact, given their shortage of doctors, uh, in some sense, you could say it, it should be even faster. And if we can find the right uh, cooperative effort, uh, I think we can surprise people on how quickly we provide benefits there. So we have unfortunately only five minutes left. Uh, and I know how strict they are and people want lunch. So you've got a minute each. Uh, and uh, so what I would like you to focus on, I knew this would be a problem because um, there's so much to talk about. In the light of what you've heard, in the view that we have to solve these problems, you know, it's not a day, you're in actual doing things, what is the most important single thing that you want to see happen which will make things better from where you sit? And do you have a minute? I apologize. President Kagami. Well, I'm an optimist as well as a realist, so I see things for what they are. There are problems, and they can be addressed. The underlying importance lies in cooperation, and the people can still cooperate. But we cannot deny the fact that there are differences within nations, whether in the south, but more significant south and the north. There's no question about that, about that. And there is uh, uh, domination, if you will, sometimes. There are dictates that people bring uh, to play into whatever is happening every day. So we can, uh, and these debates have been there for a long time. This is not the first debate about that. So, but that means if the, such a debate has been there for a long time, it also means the problem is continuing. But we can really address all these matters through cooperation and also uh, looking at the root cause of whatever problem we are talking about. Thank you very, very much. Um, your last word on <laughs> the single most important thing you want to ha happen, if you could. Well, let me start by saying that in spite of the numbers I gave of the inverting shares of trade, between North and South, we have to acknowledge that there are parts of the world that haven't benefited as much. If we look at least developed countries, their share of trade has been 1% and has remained stagnant. Uh, Africa's share of trade has remained also stagnant at 3% or less. So my big wish is how can the trading system be reformed and moved in such a way that those countries that have not benefited as much, even with these changing shares, can benefit more from the trading system. Um, and how do we do it in such a way that we cooperate and collaborate? And um, I, I just want to put a shout out for my own organization. I think Prime Minister Rutte has been doing it mostly. But to say that, yes, we had difficulties at the WTO because developing countries did not see themselves benefiting and, and there was this trust issue. At the same time, developed countries feel that some emerging markets are benefiting maybe too much from the system. 
So what I'd like to see is us coming together as we did at our last ministerial, working in an interdependent way with strategic cooperation to deliver more for those who didn't benefit from the system. Thank you very much. President Petro, really briefly, <laughs> you can see the time. Um, make one powerful, simple point about what you think can be done now. Me gustaría ver dos cosas. Una es, indudablemente, el proyecto democrático en la humanidad está en peligro, inminente. Por eso hay que restablecer el poder del derecho internacional. Es una conquista civilizatoria y hoy prácticamente se ha vuelto pedazos. Hay que restablecerlo. La consigna libertad, igualdad, fraternidad que creó la Revolución Francesa ya no tiene sede en París, tiene su sede en Sudáfrica. Y esa es la nueva realidad. Y el otro punto que me parece que quisiera ver este año, ojalá, es el cambio de la dimensión para abordar la crisis climática. Los 100 mil millones de dólares de París ya no son nada. La cantidad que se necesita cada año es 30 veces superior. Eso implica el cambio del sistema financiero mundial. Si lográramos establecer una política por acuerdo de deuda, de cambio, de canje, de deuda por acción climática, podríamos llegar a esas cifras 30 veces superior a lo que se prometió en París, generado con los recursos públicos de todos los países del mundo e invertidos en un gran plan Marshall de acción climática en el planeta Tierra para preservar la vida en el planeta. Mark Rutter, obviously gathered here in Davos, we are very worried about Ukraine and we are very worried about the Middle East. And at the same time, we are thinking of the energy transition and uh, the need uh, for uh, fighting uh, the warming of our planet, uh, so climate change. And I would hope for two things. One is to reform the multilateral system. And it is tilting too much at this moment to the north. And it has to be incorporating, and should incorporate the fact uh, that the world has changed, including the IMF, including uh, the whole system of development banks. It should tilt two more, more to the south. And secondly, we need to invest in the quality of governance at the national level wherever necessary. And uh, we need to help each other also in that respect. Bill Gates, very last word. Okay. One sentence, if possible. Well, sadly, I'd say that the resources coming from the north, uh, there's not much upside. And so the idea of using the power of innovation, whether it's in climate or health or in education, and prioritizing pop, uh, properly by listening uh, to what the countries are asking for, what their priorities are, uh, I remain optimistic, and that's partly from the great successes that we can build on. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to summarize except to make three points. I know I've already exceeded time, a bit better than the last session, I should say. Uh, the, uh, um, there's obviously an immense amount of frustration and anger. The system is obviously still very heavily weighted in many ways to the countries of the North. It would be very nice to think we can fix that. Uh, we've been in these discussions a lot. We can probably improve it. But I would endorse a very important point made at the end by Bill Gates, that a lot of what we're going to have to do will be being very, very clever in the way we innovate, both in the economy and in our institutions. It's going to be an immensely difficult struggle to manage these problems. And we have to recognize that we have to do almost everything to do so. Um, thank you very much. I think it's been a, a wonderful panel, if far too short, uh, and I think a lot of very important points and ideas have been put forward. Please thank you.